I, young in life, by seeming cruel fate, Was snatched from Afric's fancied happy seat. What pangs excruciating must molest, What sorrows labour in my parents' breast. Steeled was that soul, and by no misery moved, That for a father seized his babe beloved. Such, such my case, and can I then but pray Others may never feel tyrannic sway. The 19-year-old author of those lines was Phyllis Wheatley, who published her book Poems on Various Subjects, Religious and Moral, in 1773, which is five years before the publication of Evelina. Phyllis Wheatley was a black slave, and it is pointed out by Ignatius Sancho, a black letterist, that while people were happy to buy her poems, they were not willing to contribute to buy her freedom. Today I will be reading um, the first chapter from the interesting narrative of the life of Alauda Equiano, the African, written by himself. This was published in, um, sorry, I'm scrolling through because all my information today is online and not in books. This was published in um, 1789, so seven years after the publication of Cecilia. Um, Equiano was a slave who was able to buy his freedom. He learnt to read and write, became extremely literary, and was one of the, um, it was the first authentic account of slavery written by a former slave. In 18th century London, by 1780, there were about 20,000 black people. No, not in London, in Great Britain. This is contrasted to about almost a million black slaves working in British Caribbean plantations. There were only 5 million people in Great Britain at the time altogether. Um, before I read the first chapter of his autobiography, um, his memoirs, as it were, I will explain the links that I've put underneath this video. Firstly, to um, the article from which I've got the information and where I found out about Alauda Equiano's um, accounts from the British Library, which is an account of African writers and black thought in 18th century Britain. Secondly, to an article from the Daily Beast, The Battle Over Jane Austen's Whiteness, um, which confronts the problem of whitewashing in period dramas and was inspired by um, fan response to certain aspects of the recent adaptation of Jane Austen's Sanditon, which included the first black character um, to be represented um, in an adaptation, a period adaptation of Jane Austen. Um, I'm also including um, a link to a Twitter thread um, and a survey. This is for people educated in Britain on the impact of omission in terms of what is being taught in history lessons in school. I studied history for three years at Key Stage 3, which is when it's compulsory in Britain. Um, and in those three years, I don't believe we ever mentioned the term British Empire or addressed any issues of slavery or indeed Britain's relationship with the outside world, apart from when we did the First and Second World War in year nine. And potentially looking at Christopher Columbus from a very one sided perspective when we did the Tudors and Stuarts. I can't really remember. Certainly I got through my compulsory years of history education without having been educated at all in Britain's role in colonialisation and the slave trade. So if you are somebody who's educated in Britain, please consider taking part in that survey. Um, I'm also including a link to the Project Gutenberg page where you'll be able to read the rest of the autobiography that I'm going to start reading to you now. And finally, to a document um, that I found on Twitter that is about how to support black lives in the UK. This includes many things that you can read to educate yourselves, links to places you can donate and ways in which you can support the Black Lives Matter movement in the UK. I hope you'll consider looking at it.
The interesting narrative of the life of Alauda Equiano, or Gustavus Vassa the African, written by himself. To the Lords Spiritual and Temporal and the Commons of the Parliament of Great Britain. My Lords and Gentlemen, permit me with the greatest deference and respect to lay at your feet the following genuine narrative, the chief design of which is to excite in your august assemblies a sense of compassion for the miseries which the slave trade has entailed on my unfortunate countrymen. By the horrors of that trade was I first torn away from all the tender connections that were naturally dear to my heart, but these, through the mysterious ways of providence, I ought to regard as infinitely more than compensated by the introduction I have thence obtained to the knowledge of the Christian religion, and of a nation which, by its liberal sentiments, its humanity, the glorious freedom of its government, and its proficiency in arts and sciences, has exalted the dignity of human nature. I am sensible I ought to entreat your pardon for addressing to you a work so wholly devoid of literary merit, but as the production of an unlettered African, who is actuated by the hope of becoming an instrument towards the relief of his suffering countrymen. I trust that such a man, pleading in such a cause, will be acquitted of boldness and presumption. May the God of heaven inspire your hearts with peculiar benevolence on that important day when the question of abolition is to be discussed, when thousands, in consequence of your determination, are to look for happiness or misery. I am, my lords and gentlemen, your most obedient and devoted humble servant, Olauda Equiano or Gustavus Fassa, Union Street, Marylebone, March 24th, 1789. There then follows a very long list of subscribers to this work, which if you look on the Project Gutenberg, you may find interesting for their variety of names and statuses. Chapter one. I believe it is difficult for those who publish their own memoirs to escape the imputation of vanity, nor is this the only disadvantage under which they labour. It is also their misfortune that what is uncommon is rarely if ever believed, and what is obvious we are apt to turn from with disgust, and to change the, charge the writer with impertinence. People generally think those memoirs only worthy to be read or remembered which abound in great or striking events, those in short which in a high degree excite either admiration or pity all others they consign to contempt and oblivion. It is therefore, I confess, not a little hazardous in a private and obscure individual, and a stranger too, thus to solicit the indulgent attention of the public, especially when I own I offer here the history of neither a saint, a hero, nor a tyrant. I believe there are few events in my life which have not happened to many. It is true the incidents of it are numerous, and did I consider myself an European, I might say my sufferings were great, but when I compare my lot with that of most of my countrymen, I regard myself as a particular favourite of heaven, and acknowledge the mercies of providence in every occurrence of my life. If, then, the following narrative does not appear sufficiently interesting to engage general attention, let my motive be some excuse for its publication. I am not so foolishly vain as to expect from it either immortality or literary reputation. If it affords any satisfaction to my numerous friends, at whose request it has been written, or in the smallest degree promotes the interests of humanity, the ends for which it was undertaken will be fully attained, and every wish of my heart gratified. Let it therefore be remembered that in wishing to avoid censure, I do not aspire to praise. That part of Africa, known by the name of Guinea, to which the trade for slaves is carried on, extends along the coast above 3,400 miles, from the Senegal to Angola, and includes a variety of kingdoms. Of these, the most considerable is the kingdom of Benin, both as to extent and wealth, the richness and cultivation of the soil, the power of its king, and the number and warlike disposition of the inhabitants. It is situated nearly under the line, and extends along the coast about 170 miles, but runs back into the interior part of Africa to a distance hitherto, I believe, unexplored by any traveller and seems only terminated at length by the empire of Abyssinia, near 1,500 miles from its beginning. This kingdom is divided into many provinces or districts. In one of the most remote and fertile of which, called Eboe, I was born, in the year 1745, in a charming fruitful vale named Essica. The distance of this province from the capital of Benin and the sea coast must be very considerable, for I never heard of white men or Europeans, nor of the sea, 
and our subjection to the King of Benin was little more than nominal. For every transaction of the government, as far as my slender observation extended, was conducted by the chiefs or elders of the place. The manners and government of a people who had little commerce with other countries are generally very simple, and the history of what passes in one family or village may serve as a specimen of a nation. My father was one of those elders or chiefs I have spoken of, and was styled Embrenchi, a term, as I remember, importing the highest distinction, and signifying in our language a mark of grandeur. This mark was con is conferred on the person entitled to it by cutting the skin across at the top of the forehead, and drawing it down to the eyebrows, and while it is in this situation, applying a warm hand and rubbing it until it shrinks up into a thick wheel across the lower part of the forehead. Most of the judges and senators were thus marked. My father had long borne it, I had seen it conferred on one of my brothers, and I was also destined to receive it by my parents. Those embrenchi, or chief men, decided disputes and punished crimes, for which purpose they always assembled together. The proceedings were generally short, and in most cases the law of retaliation prevailed. I remember a man was brought before my father and other judges for kidnapping a boy, and though he was the son of a chief or senator, he was condemned to make recompense by a man or woman slave. Adultery, however, was sometimes punished with slavery or death, a punishment which I believe is inflicted on it throughout most of the nations of Africa. So sacred among them is the honour of the marriage bed, and so jealous are they of the fidelity of their wives. Of this I recollect an instance. A woman was convicted before the judges of adultery, and delivered over, as the custom was, to her husband to be punished. Accordingly, he determined to put her to death. But it being found just before her execution that she had an infant at her breast, and no woman being prevailed on to perform the part of a nurse, she was spared on account of the child. The men, however, do not preserve the same constancy to their wives which they expect from them, for they indulge in a plurality, though seldom in more than two. Their mode of marriage is thus. Both parties are usually betrothed when young by their parents, though I have known the males to betroth themselves. On this occasion a feast is prepared, and the bride and bridegroom stand up in the midst for their friends who are assembled for the purpose, while he declares she is thenceforth to be looked upon as his wife, and that no other person is to pay any addresses to her. This is also immediately proclaimed in the vicinity, on which the bride retires from the assembly. Some time after that she is brought home to her husband, and then another feast is made, to which the relations of both parties are invited. Her parents then deliver her to the bridegroom, accompanied with a number of blessings, and at the same time they tie round her waist a cotton string of the thickness of a goose quill, which none but married women are permitted to wear. She is now considered as completely his wife, and at this time the dowry is given to the new married pair, which generally consists of portions of land, slaves and cattle, household goods and implements of husbandry. These are offered by the friends of both parties, besides which the parents of the bridegroom present gifts to those of the bride, whose property she has looked upon before marriage, but after it she is esteemed the sole property of her husband. The ceremony being now ended, the festival begins, which is celebrated with bonfires and loud acclamations of joy accompanied with music and dancing. We are almost a nation of dancers, musicians and poets. Thus every great event, such as a triumphant return from battle, or other cause of public rejoicing, is celebrated in public dances, which are accompanied with songs and music suited to the occasion. The assembly is separated into four divisions, which dance either a part or in succession, and each with a character peculiar to itself. The first division contains the married men, who in their dances frequently exhibit feats of arms and the representation of a battle. To these succeed the married women, who dance in the second division. The young men occupy the third, and the maidens the fourth. Each represents some interesting scene of real life, such as a great achievement, domestic employment, a pathetic story, or some rural sport. And as the subject is generally founded on some recent event, it is therefore ever new. This gives our dances a spirit and variety which I have scarcely seen elsewhere. We have many musical instruments, particularly drums of different kinds, a piece of music which resembles a guitar, and another much like a staccato. These last are chiefly used by betrothed virgins, who play on them at all grand festivals. As our manners are simple, our luxuries are few. The dress of both sexes is nearly the same. It generally consists of a long piece of calico or muslin, 
wrapped loosely round the body, somewhat in the form of a highland plaid. This is usually dyed blue, which is our favourite colour. It is extracted from a berry, and is brighter and richer than any I have seen in Europe. Besides this, our women of distinction wear golden ornaments, which they dispose with some profusion on their arms and legs. When our women are not employed with the men in tillage, their usual occupation is spinning and weaving cotton, which they afterwards dye and make it into garments. They also manufacture earthen vessels, of which we have many kinds. Among the rest, tobacco pipes, made after the same fashion and used in the same manner as those in Turkey. Our manner of living is entirely plain, for as yet the natives are unacquainted with those refinements in cookery which debauch the taste. Bullocks, goats and poultry supply the greatest part of their food. These constitute likewise the principal wealth of the country and the chief articles of its commerce. The flesh is usually stewed in a pan. To make it savoury, we sometimes use also pepper and other spices, and we have salt made of wood ashes. Our vegetables are mostly plantains, eaters, yams, beans and Indian corn. The head of the family usually eats alone. His wives and slaves have also their separate tables. Before we taste food, we always wash our hands. Indeed, our cleanliness on all occasions is extreme, but on this it is an indispensable ceremony. After washing, libation is made by pouring out a small portion of the food in a certain place for the spirits of departed relations, which the natives suppose to preside over their conduct and guard them from evil. They are totally unacquainted with strong or spirituous liquors, and their principal beverage is palm wine. This is gotten from a tree of that name by tapping it at the top and fastening a large gourd to it, and sometimes one tree will yield three or four gallons in a night. When just drawn, it is of a most delicious sweetness, but in a few days it acquires a tartish and more spirituous flavour, though I never saw anyone intoxicated by it. The same tree also produces nuts and oil. Our principal luxury is in perfumes. One sort of these is an odoriferous wood of delicious fragrance, the other a kind of earth, a small portion of which, thrown into the fire, diffuses a most powerful odour. We beat this wood into powder and mix it with palm oil, with which both men and women perfume themselves. In our buildings we study convenience rather than ornament. Each master of a family has a large square piece of ground, surrounded with a moat or fence, or enclosed with a wall made of red earth tempered, which, when dry, is as hard as brick. Within this are his houses to accommodate his family and slaves, which, if numerous, frequently present the appearance of a village. In the middle stands the principal building, appropriated to the sole use of the master, and consisting of two apartments, in one of which he sits in the day with his family, the other is left apart for the reception of his friends. He has, as, besides these, a distinct apartment in which he sleeps together with his male children. On each side are the apartments of his wives, who have also their separate day and night houses. The habitations of the slaves and their families are distributed throughout the rest of the enclosure. These houses never exceed one storey in height. They are always built of wood or stakes driven into the ground, crossed with wattles, and neatly plastered within and without. The roof is thatched with reeds. Our day houses are left open at the sides, but those in which we sleep are always covered and plastered on the inside with a composition mixed with cow dung to keep off the different insects which annoy us during the night. The walls and floors also of these are generally covered with mats. Our beds consist of a platform raised three or four feet from the ground on which are laid skins and different parts of a spongy tree called plantain. Our covering is calico or muslin, the same as our dress. The usual seats are a few logs of wood, but we have benches which are generally perfumed to accommodate strangers. These compose the greater part of our household furniture. Houses so constructed and furnished require but little skill to erect them. Every man is sufficient architect for the purpose. The whole neighbourhood afford their unanimous assistance in building them and in return receive and expect no other recompense than a feast. As we live in a country where nature is prodigal of her favours, our wants are few and easily supplied. Of course we have few manufactures. They consist for the most part of calicos, earthenware, ornaments and instruments of war and husbandry. But these make no small part, make no part of our commerce, the principal articles of which, as I have observed, are provisions. In such a state money is of little use. However, we have some small pieces of coin, if I may call them such. 
They all made something like an anchor, but I do not remember either their value or denomination. We have also markets, at which I have been frequently with my mother. These are sometimes visited by stout, mahogany-coloured men from the south-west of us. We call them Oya Obo, which term signifies red men living at a distance. They generally bring us firearms, gunpowder, hats, beads and dried fish. The last we esteemed a great rarity, as our waters were only brooks and springs. These articles they barter with us for odoriferous woods and earth, and our salt of wood ashes. They always, they always carry slaves through our land, but the strictest account is exacted of their manners of procuring them before they are suffered to pass. Sometimes, indeed, we sold slaves to them, but they were only prisoners of war, or such among us as had been convicted of kidnapping or adultery, or some other crimes, which we esteemed heinous. This practice of kidnapping induces me to think that, notwithstanding all our strictness, their principal business among us was to trepan our people. I remember, too, they carried great sacks along with them, which not long after I had an opportunity of fatally seeing applied to that infamous purpose. Our land is uncommonly rich and fruitful, and produces all kinds of vegetables in great abundance. We have plenty of Indian corn, and vast quantities of cotton and tobacco. Our pineapples grow without culture, they are about the size of the largest sugar loaf, and finely flavoured. We have also spices of different kinds, particularly pepper, and a variety of delicious fruits which I have never seen in Europe, together with gums of various kinds and honey in abundance. All our industry is exerted to improve those blessings of nature. Agriculture is our chief employment, and everyone, even the children and women, are engaged in it. Thus we are all habituated to labour from our earliest years. Everyone contributes something to the common stock, and as we are unacquainted with idleness, we have no beggars. The benefits of such a mode of living are obvious. The West India planters prefer the slaves of Benin or Eboe to those of any other part of Guinea for their hardiness, intelligence, integrity and zeal. Those benefits are felt by us in the general healthiness of the people and in their vigour and activity. I might have added too in their comeliness. Deformity is indeed unknown amongst us. I mean that of shape. Numbers of the natives of Eboe now in London might be brought in support of this assertion. For in regard to complexion, ideas of beauty are wholly relative. I remember while in Africa to have seen three Negro children, who were tawny, and another quite white, who were universally regarded by myself and the natives in general, as far as related to their complexions, as deformed. Our women, too, were in my eyes at least uncommonly graceful, alert, and modest to a degree of bashfulness, nor do I remember to have ever heard of an instance of incontinence amongst them before marriage. They are also remarkably cheerful. Indeed, cheerfulness and affability are two of the leading characteristics of our nation. Our tillage is exercised in a large plain or common, some hours walk from our dwellings, and all the neighbours resort thither in a body. They use no beasts of husbandry, and their only instruments are hoes, axes, shovels and beaks, or pointed iron to dig with. Sometimes we are visited by locusts, which come in large clouds so as to darken the air and destroy our harvest. This, however, happens rarely, but when it does, a famine is produced by it. I remember an instant or two wherein this happened. This common is often the theatre of war, and therefore when our people go out to till their land, they not only go in a body, but generally take their arms with them for fear of a surprise, and when they apprehend an invasion, they guard the avenues to their dwellings by driving sticks into the ground, which are so sharp at one end as to pierce the foot, and are generally dipped in poison. From what I can recollect of these battles, they appear to have been eruptions of one little state or district on the other, to obtain prisoners or booty. Perhaps they were incited to this by those traders who brought them European gods, I, goods I mentioned amongst us. Such a mode of obtaining slaves in Africa is common, and I believe more procured this way and by kidnapping than any other. When a trader wants slaves, he applies to a chief for them and tempts him with his wares. It is not extraordinary if on this occasion he yields to the temptation with as little firmness and accepts the price of his fellow creature's liberty with as little reluctance as the enlightened merchant. Accordingly, he falls on his neighbours, and a desperate battle ensues. If he prevails and takes prisoners, he gratifies his avarice by selling them. But if his party be vanquished, and he falls into the hands of the enemy, he is put to death. For as he has been known to foment their quarrels, it is thought dangerous to let him survive, and no ransom can save him, though all other prisoners may be redeemed. 
We have firearms, bows and arrows, broad two-edged swords and javelins. We have shields also which cover a man from head to foot. All are taught to use the use of these weapons. Even our women are warriors and march boldly out to fight along with the men. Our whole district is a kind of militia. On a certain signal given, such as the firing of a gun at night, they all rise in arms and rush upon their enemy. It is perhaps something remarkable that when our people march to the field, a red flag or banner is borne before them. I was once a witness to a battle in our common. We had been all at work in it one day as usual, when our people were suddenly attacked. I climbed a tree at some distance from which I beheld the fight. There were many women as well as men on both sides. Among others, my mother was there, and armed with a broad sword. After fighting for a considerable time with great fury, and after many had been killed, our people obtained the victory and took their enemy's chief prisoner. He was carried off in great triumph, and though he offered a large ransom for his life, he was put to death. A virgin of note among our enemies had been slain in the battle, and her arm was exposed in our marketplace where our trophies were always exhibited. The spoils were divided according to the merit of the warriors. Those prisoners which were not sold or redeemed we kept as slaves, but how different was their condition from that of the slaves in the West Indies? With us, they do no more work than other members of the community, even their masters. Their food, clothing and lodging were nearly the same as theirs, except that they were not permitted to eat with those who were free-born, and there was scarce any other difference between them than a superior degree of importance which the head of a family possesses in our state, and that authority which, as such, he exercises over every part of his household. Some of these slaves have even slaves under them as their own property, and for their own use. As to religion, the natives believe that there is one creator of all things, and that he lives in the sun, and is girted round with a belt that he may never eat or drink. But according to some, he smokes a pipe, which is our own favourite luxury. They believe he governs events, especially our deaths or captivity. But as for the doctrine of eternity, I do not remember to have ever heard of it. Some, however, believe in the transmigration of souls in a certain degree. Those spirits which are not transmigrated, such as our dear friends or relations, they believe always attend them and guard them from the bad spirits or their foes. For this reason they always, before eating, as I have observed, put some small portion of the meat and pour some of their drink on the ground for them, and they often make oblations of the blood of beasts or fowls at their graves. I was very fond of my mother and almost constantly with her. When she went to make these oblations at her mother's tomb, which was a kind of small solitary thatched house, I sometimes attended her. There she made her libations and spent most of the night in cries and lamentations. I have often been extremely terrified on these occasions. The loneliness of the place, the darkness of the night, and the ceremony of libation, naturally awful and gloomy, were heightened by my mother's lamentations. And these, concurring with the cries of doleful birds, by which these places were frequented, gave an inexpressible terror to the scene. We compute the year from the day on which the sun crosses the line, and on its setting that evening there is a general shout throughout the land. At least I can speak from my own knowledge throughout our vicinity. The people at the same time make a great noise with rattles, not unlike the basket rattles used by children here, though much larger, and hold up their hands to heaven for a blessing. It is then the greatest offerings are made, and those children whom our wise men foretell will be fortunate are then presented to different people. I remember many used to come to see me, and I was carried about to others for that purpose. They have many offerings, particularly at full moons, generally two at harvest before the food, fruits are taken out of the ground, and when any young animals are killed, sometimes they offer up part of them as a sacrifice. These offerings, when made by one of the heads of the family, serve for the whole. I remember we often had them at my father's and my uncle's, and their families have been present. Some of our offerings are eaten with bitter herbs. We had a saying among us to anyone of a cross temper that if they were to be eaten, they should be eaten with bitter herbs. We practised circumcision like the Jews and made offerings and feasts on that occasion in the same manner as they did. Like them also, our children were named from some event, some circumstance or fancied foreboding at the time of their birth. I was named Olauda, which in our language signifies vicissitude or fortune also one favoured, and having a loud voice and well spoken. I remember we never polluted the name of the object of our adoration. On the contrary, it was always mentioned with the greatest reverence, and we were totally unacquainted with swearing, 
at all those terms of abuse and reproach which find their way so readily and copiously into the languages of more civilised people. The only expressions of that kind I remember were, may you rot or may you swell or may a beast take you. I have before remarked that the natives of this part of Africa are extremely cleanly. This necessary habit of decency was with us a part of religion, and therefore we had many purifications and washings. Indeed, almost as many, and used on the same occasions, if my recollection does not fail me, as the Jews. Those that touched the dead at any time were obliged to wash and purify themselves before they could enter a dwelling house. Every woman, too, at certain times, was forbidden to come into a dwelling house or touch any person or anything we ate. I was so fond of my mother I could not keep from her, or avoid touching her at some of these periods, in consequence of which I was obliged to be kept out with her, in a little house made for that purpose, till offering was made, and then we were purified. Though we had no places of public worship, we had priests and magicians, or wise men. I do not remember whether they had different offices, or whether they were united in the same persons, but they were held in great reverence by the people. They calculated our time and foretold events, as their name imported, for we called them Ar Afoe We Ka, which signifies calculators or yearly men, our year being called Ar Afoe. They wore their beards, and when they died, they were succeeded by their sons. Most of their implements and things of value were interred along with them. Pipes and tobacco were also put into the grave with the corpse, which was always perfumed and ornamented, and animals were offered in sacrifice to them. None accompanied their funerals, but those of the same profession or tribe. These buried them after sunset, and always returned from the grave by a different way from which they went. These magicians were also our doctors or physicians. They practised bleeding by cupping, and were very successful in healing wounds and expelling poisons. They had likewise some extraordinary method of discovering jealousy, theft and poisoning, the success of which no doubt they derived from their unbounded influence over the credulity and superstition of the people. I do not remember what those methods were, except that as to poisoning. I recollect an instance or two, which I hope it will not be deemed impertinent here to insert, as it may serve as a kind of specimen of the rest, and is still used by the Negroes in the West Indies. A virgin had been poisoned, but it was not known by whom. The doctors ordered the corpse to be taken up by some persons and carried to the grave. As soon as the bearers had raised it on their shoulders, they seemed seized with some sudden impulse and ran to and fro, unable to stop themselves. At last, having been, after having passed through a number of thorns and prickly bushes unhurt, the corpse fell from them close to a house, and defaced it in the fall, and the owner being taken up, he immediately confessed the poisoning. The natives are extremely cautious about poison. When they buy any eatable, the seller kisses it all round before the buyer, to show it it is not poisoned, and the same is done when any meat or drink is presented, particularly to a stranger. We have serpents of different kinds, some of which are esteemed ominous when they appear in our houses, and these we never molest. I remember two of those ominous snakes, each of which was as thick as the calf of man's leg, and in colour resembling a dolphin in the water, crept at different times into my mother's night house, where I always lay with her, and coiled themselves into folds, and each time they crowed like a cock. I was desired by some of our wise men to touch these, that I might be interested in the good omens, which I did, for they were quite harmless, and would tamely suffer themselves to be handled and then they were put into a large open earthen pan and set on one side of the highway. Some of our snakes, however, were poisonous. One of them crossed the road one day when I was standing on it and passed between my feet without offering to touch me, to the great surprise of many who saw it. And these incidents were accounted by the wise men, and therefore by my mother and the rest of the people, as remarkable omens in my favour. Such is the imperfect sketch my memory has furnished me with the manners and customs of a people among whom I first drew my breath. And here I cannot forbear suggesting what has long struck me very forcibly, namely the strong analogy which, even by this sketch, imperfect as it is, appears to prevail into in the manners and customs of my countrymen and those of the Jews before they reached the land of promise, and particularly the patriarchs while they were yet in that pastoral state which is described in Genesis. An analogy which alone would induce me to think that the one people had sprung from the other, Indeed, this is the opinion of Dr Gill, 
who in his commentary on Genesis very ably deduces the pedigree of the Africans from Afer and Afra, the descendants of Abraham, by Keturah his wife and concubine, for both these titles are applied to her. It is also conformable to the sentiments of Dr John Clarke, formerly Dean of Sarum, in his Truth of the Christian Religion. Both these authors, authors concur in ascribing to us this original. The reasonings of these gentlemen are still further confirmed by the scripture chronology, and if any further corroboration were required, this resemblance in so many respects is a strong evidence in support of the opinion. Like the Israelites in their primitive state, our government was conducted by our chiefs or judges, our wise men and elders, and the head of a family with us enjoyed a similar authority over his household, with that which is ascribed to Abraham and the other patriarchs. The law of retaliation obtained almost universally with us as with them, and even their religion appeared to have shed upon us a ray of its glory, though broken and spent in its passage, or eclipsed by the cloud with which time, tradition and ignorance might have enveloped it. For we had our circumcision, a rule I believe peculiar to that people. We had also our sacrifices and burnt offerings, our washings and purifications, on the same occasions as they had. As to the difference of colour between the Eboan Africans and the modern Jews, I shall not presume to account for it. It is a subject which has engaged the pens of men of both genius and learning, and is far above my strength. The most able and reverend Mr T. Clarkson, however, in his much-admired essay on the slavery and commerce of the human species, has ascertained the cause, in a manner that at once solves every objection on that account, and on my mind at least has produced the fullest conviction. I shall therefore refer to that performance for the theory, contenting myself with extracting a fact as related by Dr Mitchell. The Spaniards who have inhabited America under the Torrid Zone for any time are become as dark-coloured as our native Indians of Virginia, of which I myself have been a witness. There is also another instance of a Portuguese settlement at Mitomba, a river in Sierra Leona, where the inhabitants are bred from a mixture of the first Portuguese discoverers with the natives, and are now become in their complexion, and in the woolly quality of their hair, perfect Negroes, retaining however a smattering of the Portuguese language. These instances, and a great many more which might be adduced, while they show how the complexions of the same persons vary in different climates, it is hoped may tend also to remove the prejudice that some conceive against the natives of Africa on account of their colour. Surely the minds of the Spaniards did not change with their complexions. Are there not causes enough to which the apparent inferiority of an African may be ascribed without limiting the goodness of God, and supposing he forbore to stamp understanding on certainly his own image, because carved in ebony? Might it not naturally be ascribed to their situation? When they come among Europeans, they are ignorant of their language, religion, manners and customs. Are any pains taken to teach them these? Are they treated as men? Does not slavery itself depress the mind and extinguish all its fire and every noble sentiment? But above all, what advantages do not a refined people possess over those who are rude and uncultivated? Let the polished and haughty European recollect that his ancestors were once, like the Africans, uncivilised and even barbarous. Did nature make them inferior to their sons? And should they too have been made slaves? Every rational mind answers no. Let such reflections as these melt the pride of their superiority into sympathy for the wants and miseries of their sable brethren, and compel them to acknowledge that understanding is not confined to feature or colour. If, when they look round the world, they feel exaltation, let it be tempered with benevolence to others and gratitude to God, who hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and whose wisdom is not our wisdom, neither are our ways his ways. I present you that first chapter without any kind of comment from myself. Have a good evening.